Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Season 1, Episode 2 of the Navigating History Podcast. I'm your host, um, Andrew, as always, and uh, today we're going to be focusing on the Battle of Issus, uh, which is the second of the major military engagements in Alexander the Great's uh, Persian campaign. Uh, before we get into that, though, I just have to say thank you so much for all of the amazing support on episode uh, on the first episode of the podcast. I mean, the fact that anybody listened at all was fantastic, uh, and so many of you tuning in and listening, and all the all the feedback feedback we've been getting on the Instagram and uh, and other messages I've gotten is, is thank you so much uh, for all of the support, and uh, I hope to be bringing you content uh, you guys enjoy each and every week. So um, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Uh, so again, the Battle of the uh, Battle of Issus took place uh, in 333 uh, BCE. Uh, you know, and the background for it immediately started following, obviously, Alexander's victory at the Granicus River. Um, so, following the Granicus River, Alexander realized, okay, if I'm actually going to do this, and I'm going to, not only can I now fe- feed my army, uh, which is something that he can do. You know, he could do. They were able to. They were able to fund the campaign now after defeating the Persian army at the Granicus River, but they needed to be able to sustain their hold in Persia, uh, in Asia Minor. So what he did was he decided to take a whole bunch of coastal cities uh, in order to, again, maintain that... uh, you know, maintain his hold on Persia because the uh, the Persian navy was the biggest threat to him uh, in that part of the empire at the, at the time. So uh, the first thing that he decided to do was take a whole bunch of coastal cities uh, and making sure uh, in, in, in making sure that they, you know the, the Persian navy was cut off from the mainland so they weren't able to resupply uh, anywhere near his forces at least unless they wanted to make the journey um, to a safe harbor. Uh, so Alexander c- uh, captured uh, cities such as uh, Melitusis and uh, Halicarnassus. Uh, I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciations. Uh, obviously, I'm I'm not Greek, so or or, or Persian, so I'm not uh, I'm not exactly uh, you know the best at pronunciation. But anyway, he captured a whole a whole bunch of uh, Persian uh, coastal cities, including uh, Halicarnassus there, and again was able to sort of establish a foothold in in Persia, and he kept traveling. Um, East and uh, sent part of his army north again, looking and capturing more settlements uh, and more cities in, in in Persia, and then in 333 BCE, after this, had, uh, after he had uh, you know captured these settlements, yeah, while I, while Alexander's army was camp uh, camped in tar- the city of Tarsus, uh, he re- started to receive word that um, the the Persians were amassing an army um, in Babylon, and that this army was to be commanded by the Persian king Darius the Third, and this is a big deal because, um, as we'll get into later, the Persian army, in fact, in the entire history of of the of the empire, had never ever been defeated so long as the Persian king was present. Uh, so never had been defeated uh, in battle so long as the Persian king himself was present. They Obviously, they'd lost other engagements before, including the Battle of Granicus less than a year ago, but genuinely, they hadn't been defeated without with their king present. Uh, so this was a big deal that Darius III, who was the king of Persia at the time, was genuinely um, going to be taking command of his army himself. Um, so Alexander realizing that, okay, this is a big deal now, that I've, you know, not necessarily realizing this is a big deal, but, you know, Okay, I've got to do something about this, and so he decided to send uh, Parmenion, who is his second in command. You will remember Parmenion from uh, my podcast on the Battle of the Granicus, and you may have heard his name before. Uh, you know, he, he intended to send Parmenion to Issus, which was the closest town to where the scouts had reported that uh, Darius's forces were gathering, and basically told him that um, you, you know your your job is to hold. Issus and the land surrounding it, so that uh, you know the the um, the Persians can't take it. So Alexander sends Parmenion to uh, 
sends Parmenion to Issus and Darius uh, hears of this, right? He obviously hears of this and reala and realizes that Parmenion, while there, has sort of left a, a garrison in the city, uh, in the city of Issus, and then, you know, sort of camped, uh, encamped around uh, the eastern path uh, towards the city of uh, Issus. Um, you know, um, and and sort of tried to block off uh, Darius's route into into the city of Ephesus, which was the best way to resupply. Um, you know, it was, it was a great area for resupply for the for the um, for the Macedonian and uh, Macedonian army. Um, and <laughs> as you can tell, I'm new at this because there's something I forgot to mention. Um, when I say Macedonian, it wasn't just the Macedonians that were involved in the campaign in Asia Minor. Um, it was the entire Hellenic League uh, that was involved. Uh, so armies and you know uh, members of the Hellenic League were all involved uh, in in this. And you know you may be asking, okay, what is the Hellenic League? The Hellenic League. Uh, was initially formed in the 5th century BC uh, to deal with the Persian invasion um, of, of Greece, you know, a few hundred years, uh, or, uh, you know, just over a hundred or so years before Alexander uh, Alexander formed it, uh, uh, helped uh, form it again, uh, and then it was rekindled and renamed the League of Corinth, uh, in histor like historians renamed it the League of Corinth, uh, officially because of the, the, fir the first uh, conference took place in Corinth, but it was formed by Philip of Macedon uh, after he was, again, urged to re reunite Greece against the Persians again uh, when they were sort of uh, raiding Macedon occasionally, and they thought that uh, many of the Greek officials thought that there might be a, a larger threat at play. Uh, this was in 338 BCE, so about five years before uh, the Battle of uh, Issus, and um, again, uh, you know, once Alexander took over, he was then put in charge of the Hellenic League as well. Um, so, uh, yeah. So when I say Macedonians, I don't just mean uh, Greeks from specifically the Mas from the uh, country of Macedon. I mean members of all of the Greek states within the Hellenic League uh, that that could have been involved. Um, in fact, it, at the Battle of Issus, Alexander specifically had Thessalian cavalry uh, with him. Um, anyway, move, moving back to the the uh, main main point after my little side tangent there about the Hellenic League. Uh, if people want as well, I can do a, a full podcast on the Hellenic League at some point as, uh, as well. But for now, basically just know that there was a Greek alliance against the Persians, and Alexander was the, the head of this alliance and the, its primary commander. Um, so our Perminians encamped outside of Issus, and Darius, uh, Darius's scouts see this, and they realize that, okay, he's encamped um, from the east, so he's taken the easiest route uh, away from us. So if we're going to get to the city without engaging him, um, we're going to take the north road. Um, we're going to take the, the north road to Issus and avoid the, the Greeks entirely, um, which... Darius does, and because of this, you know, Parmenian isn't aware that he's done this, and he takes, and he takes the city of Issus, where in fact he, you know, kills not only kills the Macedonian garrison, but any sick or wounded uh, that were that were present. So any troops that Alexander's forces had left behind, uh, he takes actually cuts off their hands and like he he tortures them. It wasn't just you know killing people that. You know, killing people in battle. It was very much a almost sadistic, necess not necessarily, uh, not like it was unneeded violence against the Greeks for the wretch, and it was a you know taken as retribution for what happened at the Granicus River, um, mainly. Um, yeah, so mainly it was it was it was a gruesome, gruesome act by by the uh, uh, Persian king here, and. Um, yeah, so Alexander had at this point had met up with Parmenian uh, outside of Issus, and again had then realized that um, had then realized that Darius had taken the city, um, and Darius didn't realize that um, the uh, two uh, Greek forces had, you know, 
reco- uh, re- re- recoalesced or had, you know, uh, connected once again. And he re- he thought that there were still two armies, realizing that they had split initially. Uh, so he actually vacated the city of Issus with his army uh, in search of the uh, quote unquote, uh, you know, lesser of the Macedonian forces um, of the, uh, you know, thinking that the Macedonian army had been cut primarily, not necessarily in half, but that there was a, you know, a side that had fewer numbers and that he was going to attack them first. You know, this is a good, this is, this would be a good strategy, but you know, if you don't know exactly what's going on, it's probably not a good idea to, to leave a fortified position. And of course he thought this is what happened, but uh, somehow Alexander had been, had managed to meet up with Parminian and that the Greek forces were now again whole. Um, so, um, Alexander realizes and, you know, uh, his scouts tell him that, um, Darius has left the city of Issus and Alexander not wanting to, um, you know, not wanting to leave a Persian army behind him. Uh, when he goes and you know delves deeper into the into the Persian Empire, decides okay we need to deal with this. So um, Dar- Darius is taken off north looking for that second uh, you know Greek army, and then realize and then Alexander decides to follow him um, and shadow him as he heads north to deal with him eventually. Um, and then, it, so eventually, uh, Darius finds out that he was wrong and that there aren't two Greek armies and realizes that, oh crap, I'm going to have to deal with all of them at once. Uh, so not exactly ideal considering he had not planned for this. Um, and they ended up, uh, meeting, uh, on the, uh, you know, they, they ended up, uh, coalescing on the, 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 the way to Issus. So in between, um, you know, just Issus was to the north uh, for us, for where they, uh, um, were, the, the two armies were, were um, situated. And just getting into the, the army sizes here, um, as I mentioned previously, the Macedonians uh, in at the Battle of Granicus had about 47,000 uh, troops and the Persians had about 35,000. Uh, by this point, a year later, uh, Darius had amassed a massive army. Uh, was definitely outnumbered the, the Persians at least, or uh, definitely outnumbered the Macedonians at least two to one um, with reports that it could have uh, risen as far as 100,000. Again, um, historians are kind of... Um, a lot of historians go back and forth on these numbers. In fact, there's a couple of historians that say that the the true uh, Persian force was much more like um, several hundred thousand uh, forces rather than just a few. Rather than just a few, uh, yeah. So rather than just a few thousand, he you know he, he had at least uh, you know double the of Alexander's forces. So it was, you know, whereas at the Battle of the Granicus, Alexander had the larger force, uh, in this, in this case, the, the Persians had the larger force and, um, this gave them, uh, the opportunity, you know, because of this, they were able to, um, you know, they, they were able to d- deploy more on their terms. Alexander was sort of, um, he was chasing a, a larger army, so he was able to catch up quickly. But at the same time, the Persians were confident in their ability because not only, obviously, were they one of the premier powers of the day, their, their, their king was present, which, again, is a big deal for them, especially for their morale, because they, like I mentioned earlier, they haven't been defeated when their king has been present, um, you know. And they have the larger army, at least two to one, uh, if not more than that. Uh, so for them, it's a big deal. Um, they they decide to deploy um, on a on a on a at the at the river. Uh, just I forget the name of the river. Unfortunately, my apologies. Just outside of uh, Issus, so very near the city. Um, in fact, and it's and it's not an ideal. Uh, sort of battlefield for either um, for for either force. the The Persian force, as I mentioned, is much larger than the, than the the Macedonian led force, and uh, so unfortunate. And what they w- would have liked to have done would have been to deploy in one long line between uh, the the beach 
and uh, and and uh, the forest. So they ended up sort of on this little two. It was a two or you know two two to three kilometer plane, um, and it again it wasn't they weren't able to deploy their full troops all in one line. Um, so Darius put his cavalry on uh, on the right. Um, so he put his cavalry on the right next to the beach. Uh, because this was the only place that it, it would be viable, at least on his side, for a cavalry charge. Uh, um, and then he stationed his uh, heavy Greek mercenary infantry uh, and also his uh, Persian uh, light infantry uh, in the in, in the center and then on the, on the left as well. Uh, one of the things, again, that gave the Persians a lot of confidence for this battle was they had the famous 10,000 immortals, uh, with them, obviously, uh, as the king, those were Darius's personal uh, personal bodyguards, basically the the creme de la creme, shall we say, of the of the Persian army there. Um, and every and again, so everything seemed to be in the Persians' favor. It was raining. The they deployed uphill. They were deployed first, so the Macedonians would have to come to them. Uh, so again, not a not an ideal situation for the Macedonians uh, at at Issus here, really, really not ideal. Um, Alexander uh, ended up deploying his army in the same uh, formation that he used at the, at the Granicus River, where he had um, where he had you know his cavalry on uh, cavalry on the wings and his uh, you know Macedonian phalanx in the center. Uh, so again. Uh, similar to the way, as it was at Granicus, he had Perminian on his left, the uh, Persian right. So I'm gonna just use the, for the, for the sake of for the sake of um, you know making everything easy. I'm just gonna use the term Persian right and Persian left uh, to make it all um, make sense, rather than flip flopping back and forth between Macedonian right, Macedonian left, Persian right, and Persian left. So um, the uh, Thessalian uh, cavalry that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Allied, Caval uh, Allied Thessalian cavalry, under the command of Herminian, Alexander II, was on the Persian, uh, was on the Persian left, and Alexander himself was stationed. Sorry, it was on the Persian right. My apologies. And Alexander himself was stationed on uh, the Persian left on the other side, uh, leading the com the companion Macedonian cavalry with the Macedonian uh, phalanx in the middle. Uh, so the battle kicked off. Um, the battle kicked off with the Persians making the first move. Unlike at the Battle of Granicus, where Alexander made the first move, the Persians uh, the Persians decided that they were going to make the first move this time and not give Alexander this opportunity. Now, personally, again, I don't think this was the best strategy but i'm not a military commander so who am i to really say i have studied a lot of military history just out of personal interest but you know it they, they, it, it didn't make sense for them to leave a relatively fortified position again they were they could possibly have been overconfident due to the factors we mentioned before with their their king being there uh the fact that they had, you know the persian cavalry were widely considered the best cavalry of the day um Persian infantry weren't as heavy in terms of their infantry. As I mentioned in um, last week's episode, the Persian infantry weren't as heavy infantry, but they were still good. But the Persian cavalry uh, was the elite cavalry of the day. The Macedonian cavalry were elite as well, but the they were not only were they t taken from the elite of the Macedonians, they were they were elite cavalry, of course. They were you know they ended up you know they they are extremely well known but the persian cavalry was widely considered the best cavalry unit of the day and um, as you'll see in this battle and obviously in many battles throughout ancient history cavalry is the key to winning ancient battles infantry soldiers are great and they do a lot of good things but unless you're the romans pretty much cavalry won the day most of the time in the ancient world where cavalry was involved in the skirmishes. Uh, and in fact, as we go through uh, on this podcast and we go through the different seasons and we lead up until medieval times, you'll see how important um, cavalry was throughout history, uh, not just in the ancient world, uh, especially with the Norman conquest of, of Italy um, and how important it was there. 
uh, how important cavalry was there too. Uh, basically, up until the Battle of Agincourt, when the uh, English longbow became so effective and, and range weapons became much more prominent, cavalry started to somewhat lose a little bit of its effect effectiveness then uh, until they also e equipped themselves, until basically the invention of gunpowder and, uh, you know, handheld firearms. But again, getting back to, uh, <laughs> getting back to the ancient world, uh, sometimes I, if you've listened to both episodes now, you may have noticed I have a tendency to go off on tangents. So I do apologize if I ever sort of go off on another historical tangent about something that's not related to this week's topic. Um, you know, it happens. Sorry. <laughs> My brain sort of works in that way where I feel like everything is connected and I can't, uh, I can't stop making connections that maybe aren't relevant. Uh, anyway, getting back to the Battle of Issus, like I said, Alexander's cavalry is deployed on the wings with his uh, Macedonian phalanx in the center, and the Persians make the first move because they have superior numbers, both in cavalry and in infantry, and uh, maybe Darius thought, all right, if we smash their cavalry on the on our um, <clears throat> on our on our right with a cavalry charge, right, the Persian right uh, with a cavalry charge, we can wipe out their infantry as they're crossing across the river. Unlike what happened at the Battle of Granicus, where uh, Alexander uh, ordered the infantry to march and then charge with the cavalry, so the inf the Persian infantry couldn't get set to deal with the Mas the uh, Macedonian infantry, and then everything sort of went poorly for them. So this was actually the more I think about it, while uh, yes, they were leaving the high ground and a fortified, a relatively fortified position. This actually does make sense because they thought, all right, if we, we have the superior numbers, we're able to overwhelm them and, and end this quickly. We can send the Greeks back to Europe with their basically either with their king dead or their tail between their legs. And this is a uh, this is a big thing. Remember, Alexander, uh, as we talked about last week, is extremely reckless when it comes to combat. Sometimes, not all the time. I mean, he's a he was a fantastic military commander and he had a great mind for combat uh, and for and for sieges, um, as as seen as at uh, Halicarnassus. But uh, earlier in the year, but again, he he was he he was a young man and he did have a little bit of this reckless streak in him. That you know, okay, you know, I'm you know. Uh, a big shot and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to win. And I, he had this air of invincibility about him that is sort of not necessarily, uh, always a good thing. Although it did work for him in a lot of, in a lot of cases here. Um, anyway, so the Persians charge and they charge at Perminian on, on the left there, or sorry, on, on the, on the Persian rights, the Persian right charges at the, at, the Macedonians and they attack Prominian and instantly things are not going well for the Macedonians here. This is, this is a bad time. They're having a, they're not having a good day. Um, they're overwhelmed uh, in terms of sheer force of numbers and Prominian is forced to give ground. Alexander seeing this orders his phalanx to march straight ahead. Um, again, this, 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 I mean, I don't know what else I could have, you could have really done differently. Good idea. You got to get everybody engaged in the battle. Um, but again, this was a, a, another bad time initially for, for the Macedonians because, you know, not only did they have to charge through the rain, it was raining on this day. So this was, you know, muddy, hot, wet, gross terrain uphill and through a river while taking heavy arrow fire from the Persians. Um, so this was a tough time. This was this was a difficult uh, experience for them. This was not something that that you would want to do, uh, you know. And in fact, um, there are historians who make accounts of the fact that the arrows, the you know, the sound of the arrows making contact was was devastating for the Macedonian morale. But the only reason they were able to even continue to fight at all and even cross the river was because of how disciplined they were as a, uh, as a unit and how well trained they were, you know, without their discipline and training, a lesser force probably would have fled and the battle would have been won almost instantly because, you know, if your entire infantry force leaves, um, it's not a good thing. And, and, you know, you're as great as cavalry were, they can only do so much when they're fighting a force that is, you know, a already twice their size. And then the bulk of the army sort of, doesn't really 
um, doesn't doesn't do well. Uh, but at the same time as the Persian infantry, um, and I and I again I should mention the Persian infantry. They had some light infantry. They had the immortals, but they also had some Greek mercenary, uh, some Greek mercenaries who also operated in the form of a phalanx because it was so popular. Um, the Macedonian phalanx is probably the most, most well-known of phalanxes, but the, the, a lot of the Greek states did use a phalanx, and a lot of mercenaries, um, especially around this time, copied what was successful, so they copied the phalanx. Um, again, this this was a big deal, so they were pretty heavily armored as well, so the, you know, the Macedonian-led uh, infantry came up against the Persian-led Greek infantry, sort of, um, and... They would have been at a stalemate. Um, they're pretty much on par in terms of training and ability. Sort of maybe a slight edge to the Macedonians. Some historians give a slight edge to the Macedonians. Some historians a slight edge to the Greek mercenaries. Either way, they would have been at a stalemate uh, if they had even numbers and even and even ground. But the Persians had the higher ground, um, and they had a, they they were obviously, they obviously outnumbered the Greeks as well. So eventually the Greeks were pushed back uh, and they started to ha unfortunately have to give ground and be forced down the river um, it, to a point where, uh, you know, eventually they, again, it, it, it was not looking good. Again, like I said, they were, uh, you know, the, the Macedonian led Greeks were having a bad time uh, at the Battle of Issus. And then Alexander charged. He charged the Persian left, which was the weak point for sure for the Persians. Um, you know, Darius had, set himself up in the middle uh, with his immortals and the strongest of the um, Greek mercenary cavalry, the uh, Greek mercenary infantry, pardon me. So Darius was in the strongest position, uh, but his left was kind of weak. So the Persian left was kind of weak, not necessarily weak, but weak compared to the other aspects of the other uh, sort of sides of the Persian army. So in, compared to the center and compared to the, to the middle, they were weak to a cavalry charge. And this is where the effectiveness of cavalry comes into play because, again, Alexander is able to charge across the river and instantly have a severe impact on the on the Persian left. He he basically demolishes his um, demolishes the infantry on the Persian left, right? And this this again these were. These weren't heavy, heavy infantry, at least not all of them, with, um, you know, the, the, the extremely long series of pikes that, that were effect that would be effective against cavalry because you're able to, because you have that extra reach. But still, they were able to smash into the Persian left and do severe damage all the, all the way to the point where they were able to rout the Persian left and eventually uh, win that flank of the battle. Uh, whereas they were losing the battle in on on the Persian right and in the center, on the Persian left, Alexander's forces were able to win. The companion cavalry ended up winning the winning that part of the battle. Had already had won that part of the battle initially. So once that had been won, Alexander was able to see what was happening more clearly and see, okay, this is bad. Our our dudes are getting crushed here. We're having a bad we're having a bad day. We're not winning like. Our, our guys are getting overwhelmed because of the superior numbers. Okay, what am I going to do? Right? And he's, obsess he's assessing his options, realizing that the Persian uh, Persian rear is basically undefended, right? They don't really have a baggage train because the two armies sort of marched to meet each other and were hoping to resupply at Issus and to sort of take the city and resupply that way. Um, and I forgot to mention this earlier, but... When Darius captured Issus, it was kind of a big deal um, initially for the the Macedonians because Issus was a big supply port for them, especially along the coast because of how uh, you know thin thinly spread out they their their resources were not necessarily their their soldiers but the the resources that you know food supplies support uh, you know support I want to say support staff but you know. Um, the baggage train, any, any camp followers, anything like that, they were all sort of stretched out. Um, and Issus was a big supply port, um, for, for kicking off the rest of 
would have been kicking off the rest of Alexander's campaign, so it was imperative that they maintain control of the city. It was the largest city in the region, uh, and it was it was a it was a big deal for them because the Macedonians didn't really have any sort of naval forces. Uh, again, it's the reason that right after the Battle of the Granicus River, Alexander wanted to completely destroy the um, the 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 effectiveness, if not the ships, when it comes to the naval forces. Um, of, of the Persian Empire because they were so superior and had they been able to had to join the conflict in any meaningful way it would have been over over like it would have been it, like the Persians would have won handily because the, the Macedonians didn't have naval forces um, a lot of Greek states do have a decent did have decent navy uh, and, and did have decent uh, you know aquatic warfare but unfortunately the Macedonians were not one of them they did not have any sort of uh, any sort of, uh, at least not with them, they didn't have any, um, any sort of, um, naval, naval force whatsoever. So again, the capture of Issus was crucial, uh, for both sides, because again, Alexander to launch the rest of his campaign, uh, and, uh, Parmeni uh, uh, you know, Parmenian was sent to do that so that they could have a launch point pretty much for the rest of the, the, the campaign into Asia Minor, but, it, with Darius capturing Issus and then being in control of Issus, it's a big. It was a big deal because this could, you know, long-term Persian control of Issus again could completely dismantle the, um, completely just ruin the entire campaign. Uh, even though they had just won uh, at the Battle of Granicus and had captured several other cities, uh, Issus was basically going to be a huge jumping-off point for the rest of the basically the, the Persian heartland. So. Uh, they needed to secure it before they could move on. Otherwise, you would leave a massive uh, Persian stronghold, you know, behind you that could harass your baggage train, or they could, you know, they could cause a lot of uh, cause a lot of problems. They could conduct raids. They could, you know, they they could cause a lot of issues if they were left behind. So uh, Alexander had to win at Issus for the rest of his campaign to continue. The Persians had to win at Issus uh, too, but it was more imperative for Alexander because without a victory at Issus, the campaign was over. If the Persians lost at Issus, they could regroup and have issue. You know, they could they could sort of live. You know, as long as they were able to get out and retreat, they could live to fight another day. But for Alexander, if, if they lost at Issus, the campaign would be over, regardless of whether or not he escaped. Their efforts in Asia Minor and against the Persians would have been crippled. So crucial that they win. So Alexander, um, after defeating the enemy forces on the on the Persian on the Persian, uh, on the Persian left, was able to sort of survey the battle and realize that the the rear of the Persian center was undefended. So again, um, he he charged and somehow at one point he ended up on foot, uh, and he was charging uh, with the infantry at one point. Um, but initially he was it was on horseback and they charged into the Persian rear and. Um, you know, were able to were able to cause serious damage to the Persian rear, and and deal and and again make a decisive. It was a relatively decisive blow to fight, despite the fact that initially the Persians had been winning the war on two out of three fronts. You know, they were winning on the Persian Persian right and in the Persian center, but they had lost the Persian left. And when you lose, when you when you when you have cavalry that are sort of, I want to say undefended. Um, it's, it's, it's a really bad time. It's like if you, you know, it's like if you, you go up against, um, you know, it's like if you go up against a team in basketball and, you know, you, you've covered, you know, the Golden State Warriors from a few years ago. If I have any basketball fans in the, uh, in, in, the, in, in, amongst my listeners, you know, you have the Golden State Warriors from a few years ago. Okay. So you cover Clay Thompson, you cover Kevin Durant, but oh, you're leaving Steph Curry open. Okay, you're still going to get burned because he's amazing, or vice versa. You leave Kevin Durant. You know, so you can win. You can be. You can be doing really, really well on two fronts, but if one of them is going off, you're still going to have a bad day, uh, right? You know, Steph Curry can drop 50 points and Durant can have 12, and the Warriors would, st would still win. But and this sort of works like that. You know, the the Persians were winning on two fronts. Uh, they were they were going to win on both fronts. They were going to win. In fact. Um, I'll get into it in a second, but 
they were going to win. They 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 had they were dominating. It wasn't just like close. The 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 Greeks were retreating. They were giving ground. Uh, they were you know one of the things that happened is in the Persian center uh, at the center of the battle because of the you know barrage of arrow fire that the Macedonian cavalry uh, infantry suffered. Pardon me. They were were knocked out of their formation. Right, and the big thing about the phalanx is. We all move. They move as one unit, right? The phalanxes move as a unit. So that was a big deal. Without that, they were they were stranded. Uh, and they were, you know, a lot easier for the, the intact, uh, you know, uh, Persian infantry uh, to deal with. Uh, again, because of the Macedonian phalanx and their, their training and their discipline, they were able to sort of hold, but they did end up giving ground. Now, with Alexander's charge into the Persian rear... This all changed because now you have the Persian infantry surrounded, compacted, and surrounded by the cavalry, by the Macedonian cavalry here. So they, it, it, you know, it was, it was a big deal. You're all boxed in and you're clumped together and you're easy, you know, it's, you're right, you're easy targets. You're right there for the picking. So you have, and Alexander realized that he had a shot at the Persian king Darius. He had an opportunity to go after the Persian king and and actually completely wipe out wipe out the empire. Um uh, or not necessarily wipe out the empire, but you know, sort of cut the head off the snake if you will. Um so he charged with some of his best soldiers and I think that this is where he sort of ended up on foot. He was charging with a lot of his infantry and they were charging directly for the Persian king. And the Persian king is kind of like, oh shit, we should probably get out of here. You know, I should probably leave. This is not a good time. I want to get out of here. And he, in his attempt to flee, because of how boxed in they were with the, with the cavalry charge, he fled directly into the Greek merc the, the rear of the Greek mercenaries, who then said, oh, the guy who's paying us to be here is leaving. So why should we get killed? Um, you know, why should why should we get killed? when the person who's paying us is not going to be fighting and you know you know we don't even know if we're going to get paid because we might be dead so we got to leave so they tried to leave as well um and in fact the persians on the persian uh on the on the persian right who had actually won the day Parmenian had lost his his forces had been overrun and he was giving ground rapidly um the, the Persians on the Persian right had won, and had they been able to disengage sooner, had Parmenia not held on as long, it could have been extremely horrible for the uh, for for the the uh, the Macedonian led coalition of Greeks, because um, the Persians would have been able to do what Alexander did to them, which is swing around and attack from the rear. But on uh, you know, luckily the uh, Thessalian cavalry under the command of Herminian were able to hold out and sort of keep the Persian cavalry on the, on keep the Persian cavalry occupied enough that they weren't a factor in the rest of the battle. And then when they saw that everybody else was sort of fleeing, including their King, um, including their, their King who, you know, as I mentioned before, when the king was present, they had never, ever lost a battle in the history of their entire empire. When they see the king leaving or fleeing, they it shattered the Persian morale. It it broke them, and it became a full-on rout at that point, and, and the battle was over. Um, in fact, I, some of you may know about um, the Gordian Knot, right? The, you know, this idea that there was this completely... Um, this completely un... un Un untieable. This knot was completely, you know, unsolvable. This problem was unsolvable, uh, and the, the person who would solve it would become the, you know, the legend was, the person who would solve it would become king of Persia, uh, and um, Alexander sort of when he was staying in Gordian, just cut it in half with his sword, just sort of hacked it in two, and was like, all right, cool, I solved it, you know can't believe no one thought of this before kind of thing again this just a legend but it just sort of adds to the mythos that surrounded alexander after this battle and how what a like a great victory this was for the 
for for the, the, the Macedonian Greeks, led Greeks, because it's so important um, for the rest of his campaign. It sort of solidified him as a as a good as a good military commander, not just as somebody who sort of got lucky uh, and won as sort of is what happened at the Battle of Grand Canaveral. River. You know, Alexander got lucky a couple of times and because they had the superior numbers they and, you know, they had the superior infantry, they were able to win. But genuinely in, in, in this battle, this is the first time where you see Alexander make smart tactical decisions on this campaign. This is the first battle. This is is the first battle where you really see Alexander make like well-developed and well-informed tactical decisions. You know, the other... At the Battle of Granicus, he yes, he makes some... He obviously makes tactical decisions, but there's an argument to be made that his tactical decisions weren't the correct ones. Here, he makes all of the right moves. You know, he engages the infantry so that they're distracted, uh, at least. And, you know, he puts his most loyal follower at the time in terms in terms of, like of the Macedonian nobility in Parminian and his most experienced general in charge of the allied cavalry, which, you know, is, is important because if, you know, they weren't, if they had a, a sort of a lesser commander, maybe, um, commanding them, they would have had, it would have been a lot easier for them to break off when they were first engaged and sort of maybe flee the battle. And then again, like I mentioned, the Persian cavalry, which were the, cavalry of the premier cavalry of the day could have possibly done what alexander did when he smashed through the persian left um but because they were they had such an experienced commander under parminian they were able to they were able to have they were able to hold out long enough so that you know the the rest of the macedonian army and the rest of the macedonian war machine could actually do what it was trained to do and they would end up they could end up winning despite the fact that the the persians had you know vastly superior numbers as well and and this is again this is part of what added to this whole mythos of alexander the great being this almost unkillable like unbeatable like god of war almost was this like okay out number two to one crappy weather bad terrain bad spot you know better forces on the other side better equipped the other forces are better equipped better um you know but they better everything the persian king is there who and they've never lost a battle when their king is involved uh not just darius the third who was the king at the time but any persian king had never ever lost a battle ever as long as the king was present at the battle um and you know they had you know as uh, you know between 80 and 100,000 men they had you know they 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 had not only did they have the greeks on their side they had you know they had a counter for everything they had the high ground they had arch they were able to you know subject the persian the macedonians to archers uh, archer fire for arrow fire for for long stretches while the cal- while the infantry was advancing uh, and and also the cavalry as well Alexander still ended up winning, and it ended up being a very decisive victory. You know, it wasn't even close. Um, event eventually, the uh, you know the the fleeing Persians uh, did escape because Alexander's army only pursued until uh, there was no sunlight left uh, or daylight left, I should say, and uh, it was dusk at the time uh, that that they ended up when uh, the finding ended up sort of being decisive and the decisive moments in the battle were won. it was dusk so they didn't have a lot of time to pursue but had it gone on longer they definitely could have um they definitely could have uh you know inflicted more damage as it was the persians suffered twenty thousand cal- uh, casualties um uh, which was like insane for the time a lot of carnage sort of ensued after the battle and that's where they suffered most of their casualties was was on that retreat and everyone trying to escape and sort of being boxed in by the macedonians macedonians themselves ended up losing seven thousand men uh out of the initial roughly forty thousand that they had um and most of that was lost in the initial sort of connection or initial um conflict between the two uh, in, uh, forces of infantry and, and the fact that they were outnumbered in, in that department and that the Persians had a lot more uh, firepower 
when it came to that, uh, when it came to the infantry. But again, this was such a huge, this was such a huge battle, not just for the fact that it allowed Alexander and the Macedonians to continue their campaign in Persia, but because it, it built the mythos and the legend that is Alexander the Great. You know, before this, he was Alexander, the king of Macedon, who had won a battle a battle against a Persian force led by a Greek. Cool. Like, still successful, but like... And he'd, and he'd captured a lot of territory, and he'd, he'd won a siege. Cool. Okay. Still impressive, but there wasn't... Like, there, and, you know, and he was starting to gain a, a, a really good reputation, but there wasn't a, like mythos a legend a uh, like you know it wasn't as as mysterious and as legend legendary and as powerful uh without you know without the battle of Issus. if alexander loses the battle of Issus, not only could he have obviously even if he had managed to survive but they lost obviously the their campaign the rest of their campaign would probably have crumbled because Issus was a launching point for the rest of the campaign but his legacy would have taken a massive hit, and Alexander's legacy began building with Issus. Right? Obviously, he was a very powerful, uh, n you know, he was a very powerful person throughout the ancient worlds, and as well, not just in Macedon, but the rest of the Greek states, being the, the head of the Hel Hellenic League, later uh, coined the, the, you know, the League of Corinth. Uh, he was a very powerful member of the, of that part of the ancient world, but he, his legend grew. The, the, that is the most important thing that happened at the Battle of Issus. Other than obviously they were able to continue their campaign, his legend started to become so cru like so intertwined with the Macedonian army at this point that you know there are stories where in later battles where armies, even not necessarily against the Persians, but armies sort of just fall before him because they're like well it's the per it's uh macedonians and it's alexander oh shit we can't win you know it, it again this morale boost for his troops and the the morale you know the, the sort of like destruction of the persian morale at this battle was so huge both with alexander building his legend of defeating the persian king and the fact that the persian king for the first time in all of history was defeated huge and th this really marked the the end of Persian dominance in the region. This marked the the decline of Persian power. If you you know, if you're doing a, a history of the Persian Empire, this is when the decline of it starts. You know, this this is when they start to lose because not only has Alexander now occupied a massive swath of territory where he has supply lines and he can resupply, and he's he's you know his his army is able to. Um, you know, s maintain itself and sustain itself, and you know, not only do they have tr troops, but they they're able they're able to feed those troops. Uh, you know, if you remember from my last podcast, the Battle of Granicus, one of the big re one of the big things was, hey, uh, Memnon of Rose was saying, hey guys, let's just you know go sort of the scorched earth tactic because they can't feed themselves well. Now Alexander can afford to pay his. He can afford to pay his soldiers. He can afford to feed his soldiers. So now his Persian campaign really, really, really sort of solidifies itself, right? Um, yes, before that he'd he'd been able to, um, you know, he'd been able to solidify holdings in Persia before Issus, but with Issus he really had a backbone to start building off of. Uh, for the rest of his campaigns into Persia, which we'll get into more next week. Um, as I mentioned off the top, this is season one, episode two. So uh, the way that this is going to work is there's going to be a couple of seasons. Um, so each season is going to be on focusing on a different topics. So season one is going to be on ancient Greece. And then um, once season one is wrapped up, uh, I'm going to have, uh, there's going to be a vote on the Instagram. So if you're listening to this for the first time and, and you have no idea what navigating history is, go follow the Instagram at navigating history on Instagram. Uh, all updates for the podcast, new episode releases, they'll be posted there. Um, and, you know any information you need you need about the podcast you can get there um again um the link to the, the to the spotify uh where this podcast is available uh is uploaded there as well um so go check out navigating history at navigating history on instagram for all podcast details 
uh, as well. We are now available on Google Podcasts as well. Search uh, Navigating History uh, on uh, Google Podcasts and you will find us. Uh, so if you have anyone who might be interested in this type of pod, uh, this type of content, but they don't have Spotify, don't worry. Uh, Google Podcast, but they have Google Podcasts. Um, you know, don't worry. They can they can find us on Google Podcasts as well. Um, working on getting um, working on on uh, getting us uh, available on app on Apple Music as well. But uh, for now, uh, that requires a su- subscription that I, I don't really have the ability to pay for. But um, for now, again, Spotify, Google Podcasts, those are the best places to find us. Um, Again, follow the Instagram at Navigating History, and the link to this to the Spotify will be there. Uh, if you don't have a Spotify account, but you're interested in, or if you have friends who don't have a Spotify account, but are interested in getting one and they like this type of content, uh, obviously you can sign up for a free Spotify account. Uh, you just can't download the podcast. The only difference is that you'd have to, um, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to stream it. You couldn't download it and listen to it offline, uh, but it is free. It is available for free. So go check it out um, and, you know, recommend it to people who you think might like this type of content. And, uh, I'm only getting better in terms of this type of stuff. So, um, like I said, this is episode two. This is the second type of this content that I've ever, uh, created. So I'm I'm learning as I go and and getting better here. So, um, if, if there are any, any sort of kinks to work out or any sort of, uh, issues we'll we'll work them out as the episodes go along but the main thing to know is that you know there are going to be seasons so season one is going to be on ancient greece so we're going to do a whole bunch of different topics from ancient greece right now we're focusing on alexander and his campaigns in persia uh and then maybe we'll focus on different uh maybe we'll focus on the spartans or we'll focus on athens or or the fall of thebes or yeah what, you know, a whole bunch of different things. So, uh, again, season one is going to be on Ancient Greece. So this has been season one, episode two of the Navigating History podcast. Thank you uh, to all those who've, uh, who've listened thus far for tuning in. And uh, hope to, uh, you know, see you guys again next week. Uh, bye for now.